So in case of uh, the gold mining, we have clearly a driving force that there is a lot of money involved. You can earn a lot of money uh, in this context. So I think it's something very hard to stop. So we have to think of solutions to adapt the methods for mining and also perhaps alter the market. There are all kinds of pressures involved. For instance, the release of wastewater, release of acids, release of uh, uh, mercury in the environment, which has, an, in the end, uh, a change in the state of the environment. For instance, fish that is contaminated with uh, mercury, cattle which is uh, contaminated with mercury. Uh, and these has, of course, uh, they have, of course, impacts, uh, impacts, social, economical impacts, uh, biodiversity loss. And as a result of this, the society will respond sooner or later because also, like for instance, biodiversity loss can in the, in the, in the end also lead to economic loss because you have less uh, tourism or you might have uh, less drinking water production or you have people who die. Un pad es una montaña artificial prácticamente donde tenemos nosotros liners en la parte baja, o sea, plásticos de alta densidad para eh, recoger el, la, las, el agua más el cianuro más los metales que va a extraer el cianuro, ¿no? Entonces eh, se agrega sobre esta montaña de piedra molida que se ha colocado sobre capas se agrega la, el agua cianurada y el cianuro reacciona con los metales pesados como oro, plata, mercurio, plomo, arsénico, todo lo que puede haber ahí y los extrae, entonces estos son recuperados en la base y llevados a lagunas de lixiviación donde se va a extraer el oro, la plata y tratar metales pesados, ¿no? Entonces esa es más o menos el, la mecánica de extracción de oro y plata Y bueno, eh, el problema es liberar muchos metales pesados que son tóxicos. Cyanides are massively uh, used, uh, for instance, in uh, the USA, uh, still 80 million kilograms per uh, year uh, is used. Also here, the uh, extraction of gold from ores is, uh, is aimed for. And we see that in receiving waters, these are mainly data from developing countries here again. You see that sometimes up to several thousand times the safe concentrations in the receiving waters is observed. And most of the animals and plants are affected, but fish are in this context most sensitive. And of course, there's a whole set of uh, other metals which are associated with gold, like copper, lead, cadmium, which can also be set free during the mining process and also enter uh, and accumulate in the environment, and then you have a combined stress. But this is, of course, strongly depending on what is the uh, distribution uh, or what is the composition of the, uh, of the ore. La generación de drenaje ha sido de minas eh, por, por esta acidez, digamos que es eh, captada por el agua, por, por el oxígeno, entonces todo este ácido sulfúrico baja extrayendo metales pesados tóxicos ¿no? y matando eh, a la fauna, a la flora de los ríos y sobre todo eh, exponiendo también eh, al hombre mismo a, a peligros potenciales con metales pesados y Y bueno, el tema de la agricultura y la ganadería que también está en peligro, ¿no? You have to mine to produce one kilo of gold a thousand tons of ore. You have as a mining waste, which is the ore mine plus the sterile, you have got more than two thousand tons. You produce 358 grams of mercury, industrial mine. You consume more than two million liters of water, and normally they don't pay for it. I pay for my water at home. A lot of large companies doesn't pay for the water. They release uh, a sulfuric uh, 857 kilos for one kilo of gold. One kilo of gold is around 200 wedding bands, which is 100 weddings. Okay? This is what 100 weddings make. Release in air 27 grams of mercury, 22 grams of arsenic, more than one liter of cyanide is discharged. 238 kilos of cyanide is used, 50 kilos of tires is used for one kilo of gold, and you've got 33 tons of greenhouse emission gases emitted. 
So this is one kilo of, of gold of industrial mine. And then there are also some, some impacts which uh, people are not very aware of. Uh, impacts related to turbidity and uh, related to acidity. Uh, turbidity is often underestimated also in the context of erosion, for instance, as uh, the salt particles which are set free during the, the mining process. They are increasing the turbidity and it leads to uh, difficulties for sunlight to penetrate in the surface water. And as a result of this, you have no light and you have no energy for the ecosystem. So many of these ecosystems are simply dying, dying off, uh, and often the whole food chain is affected by this. You should also look at uh, what is the local availability of water. Sometimes you do not use so much water, but it can be for the local population. It can have already an enormous impact on their life, on their survival. Moreover, I think also the contamination, in particular in these uh, developing countries, uh, contamination of water resources can be an extra stress, and this should also be considered. Tenemos problemas allá con la contaminación de ríos, con la, eh, el, la desaparición de fuentes de agua, tanto para las, los pueblos como para la agricultura, para la ganadería. Cajamarca tradicionalmente es una región de ganadería, pero hemos perdido todas estas fuentes de agua y, y el campesino es quien sufre. Se está salinizando la tierra, se está um, desertizando o por, porque ya no hay forrajes nativos, tampoco los introducidos, por lo tanto la gente tiene que abandonar esos lugares porque no tienen medios de vida. En Cajamarca hay una incidencia muy grande de asma y el asma probablemente está asociado a, al, al uso de combustibles por parte de Anacocha. Y Anacocha eh, consume más de 3 millones de galones de, de petróleo al mes. Entonces todos esos gases que se producen por la combustión de este petróleo están viniendo hacia Cajamarca y Cajamarca se ha vuelto una ciudad con una alta contaminación atmosférica. El problema más grande que está generando el, eh, la actividad minera es el, el conflicto social, el confrontamiento que hay entre el mismo pueblo. Si realmente la, la empresa estuviera haciendo un trabajo muy sano o, o así de acuerdo a la, al lema que ellos tienen al desarrollo, entonces no, no comprarían voluntades, no regalarían uh, uh, dinero a, a líderes. No hacen desarrollo sostenible, donde llega la mina, donde llega una empresa minera gran, eh, grande o pequeña, divide a la población, genera violencia, genera conflicto, más de 200 conflictos ambientales, mineros, causados por empresas mineras en el Perú. Y las minerías se manejan ahí a través de leyes que perjudican a la población. Muchas veces son eh, problemas relacionados también con corrupción. Las minas compran autoridades, compran políticos, eh, compran jueces. Entonces, esa es la forma como eh, tratan de acallar muchas veces las las eh, protestas de, de la población, de los ciudadanos. El impacto social que viene causando Newman y el Banco Mundial en Yanacocha y hoy dueño de Conga es sin precedentes. Persecución política a líderes ambientalistas, ambientalistas eh, dirigentes ambientalistas asesinados, Nadie sabe con quién, nadie sabe quién lo asesinó, ha creado o tiene como un ejército particular que lo cuida, que es la empresa minera Forza, actualmente Security. Eh, la empresa minera Forza fue, fue compuesta, fue formada por ex eh, mandos militares del servicio de inteligencia de la dictadura militar, de, de la dictadura de Montesinos en el 2000, que se desintegró del servicio de inteligencia nacional y que pasaron luego a, a hacer sus empresas de seguridad, para dar seguridad a las empresas mineras y en este caso a Yanacocha.
La política de la empresa minera es tratar de hacer algunas obras sociales para ganarse a la población, ¿no? Pero es difícil porque la inversión ni siquiera es grande, ¿no? Eh, cuando alguna autoridad o alguna comunidad pide algo grande como una carretera, bueno, dice, no es nuestra función, pídanselo al, al gobierno. Nosotros creemos que la minería no es un, no es un desarrollo, más bien al contrario, uh, Oruro y Potosí, unos uh, departamentos mineros desde la colonia se lo han explotado todo y son las, uh, los departamentos, las ciudades más pobres que existen en Bolivia. Nobody is using heavy metals or wasting heavy metals. There's first two valuable. Secondly, the norms on, on leaching are so strict. It's not the large mining companies that dump heavy metals into the environment. I challenge you to find one example, one, in the last 10 years, where one of the large mining companies caused a big metal heavy metal spill. We have had the derrame of mercury in a very large area that was taking the mercury to Lima, but above all in a locality called Choropampa, where almost 1200 personas resultaron intoxicadas con el mercurio y bueno, eh, un proceso muy largo porque esto fue el año 2000 y hasta ahora hay gente que está, digamos, alterada desde que el mercurio destruye el sistema nervioso central en altas concentraciones. Eh, la empresa minera Intijaimi es eh, dueña de una empresa eh, estadounidense quienes eh, utilizan, eh, por ejemplo, el cianuro en grandes cantidades. Estamos hablando sobre los eh, 3.7 toneladas de cianuro que utilizan al día. The large scale miners are not angels <laughs> at all. They create acid mine drainage. They create huge environmental destruction. They use thousands of tons of cyanide. They use mercury, they use arsenic, they use every chemical you can possibly imagine to process their gold, um, or any other product for that matter. Para nosotros, lo que mencionan algunos empresarios eh, no es real, ¿no? Creo que no, no conocen el contexto en el cual nosotros vivimos. Me creemos que los documentos que presentan estas empresas transnacionales son alteradas o adulteradas. We need more monitoring data, especially in these countries like Latin America. I have also witnessed this with my own eyes, so I have the impression that some data which are there produced are not relevant. So I think. Uh, Integrated, uh, independent monitor monitoring data collection is needed and also sharing these data. Then there is this uh, entire group of artisanal mines and small-scale mines. That's about 10-12% each, so 25, maybe 30% of gold mining falls in this category. That is where actually the environmental impact is the most brutal. It's 13 million, 15 million people who live in poverty, who have no alternative, who will kill, literally, to have a job, to have something to eat, and destroy the environment on the side because they don't care. We can only stop this, not by reducing the amount, not by cutting the amount by 5-10% in the developed world. No, it's by moving these undeveloped nations to a developed nation state. And that's not going to happen with, by the way, um, substance farming and, and, and local small-scale activities. You need something much bigger than that. You need an industrialization and a service society to, to back that up. Mining can help you in, in that jump. Here you've got the gold production cost in Latin America of the industry, and you see that the production cost is $400 plus or minus. The price of gold is 1700 today. So you see that the, only a small part goes in the country which produces it. Okay? The royalty average is $34 an ounce, means that for every $1,700 of value created, 
only $35 goes to the state. So the, the tax impact is very low. And you can see that for a country like Mali. In 2009, Mali, it's the third African player in, in mining. It's the 14th gold producer worldwide. And it's almost the poorest country in the world. So here you have the proof that industrial mining doesn't impact economically and socially the country where they're mined. Large-scale mining is the minority in this industry. They employ next to nobody compared to small-scale mining and small-scale miners who are by far and away the largest, the second largest employment bracket on the planet. So we've got to get some truth into the issue rather than the fiction that large-scale is the solution and small scale is the problem. There are as many in systemic and endemic problems in large scale mining as there are with small scale mining. Artisanal and small scale mining has often direct high impacts uh, on the environment uh, because most of the waste is directly discharged, whereas the larger companies, uh, my impression is that they try to dispose the, the waste to some extent. But I think there might be a high risk that uh, all of a sudden there's a, a large disaster. So I think uh, both have for sure an impact on the environment. Artisanal mining is really a development tool. And if you take out your glasses of economic numbers, and you see the mines, you don't see the mines by the number of ingots they produce, but you see the mine by the number of jobs they created. Then you see that the environmental impact per job created is quite low in artisanal mining than industrial mining. And then you see what? That the artisanal mining, it's in fact the large scale mining. So when you buy a gram of gold made out of them, you provide jobs to a lot of people. And what's today preoccupation? Today preoccupation is to have a job tomorrow. So you have to see this mining as a job creator. The way things stand at the moment are not equitable, they are not just, they are not working for the majority. Whether you are a jeweler that has to look your customer in the eye and sell the product, knowing because there is no transparency and traceability in the supply chain where your product has come from. And that is a systemic problem in the jewellery trade. If we talk about making mining more sustainable, we are talking partially about regulating supply chains which go across countries, basically about transnational regulation. And in a context of sovereign states, that's not a very evident thing to do. So there's a lot of lack on international regulation of supply chains with regard to social and environmental criteria. However, we do see a rise in private forms of regulation and governance. And one of the most prominent ones is certification. Fair trade is an exceptionally good economic way of bringing sustainable uh, community development to poorer communities. We've seen phenomenal growth in that sector. And when I think also that the fair trade label is now recognized as a consumer label that people trust at over 80% of the population, it's not just about the money, it's also about the consumer perception of what they're buying. Some certificates, and that's been put forward in many publications, are hence more credible than others. The third party certification systems, which originate from a multi-stakeholder consultation and which have dispute settlement systems which are transparent and on which they publicly report, are considered to be more effective, more credible and more legitimate than a lot of these systems which do not have uh, some of these components. We need systems that prove what we say is true. So if you buy one of our rings, which has got the fair trade, fair mind stamp inside, the hallmark inside of it, okay, it's not my word that you're taking. 
it's not the miner's word that you're taking. It's the, in, it's the public standard and it's the independent audit that verifies that mine site and the supply chain is doing what it says it's doing. The number of, 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 of labels is causing a lot of confusion in the market, which is uh, making some of these labels less credible and also maybe less effective as a governance tool. There are momenteel more than 400 products uh, labels worldwide active. And after all, labels it well an other sort of system. At the end, the system works better than the other. And the question is, who can control how the system works? That can the government be. That can be private initiatives be. Within the certification world, you have the ICL Alliance, which itself is a sort of label gives for the better certificators. You can play the market a spelen. You can eventually false labels let an aanklagen via nationale rechtbanken. Dat zijn eigenlijk nog allemaal vragen die open staan en waar eigenlijk de toekomst gaat uitwijzen welke dynamieken zich daar ontwikkelen. Maar dat er zo'n soort van, uh, laten we zeggen, rating van de labels moet komen op hun geloofwaardigheid en op de effectief verandering die ze genereren ter plaatse, dat is wel iets wat ik denk dat in de toekomst moet gebeuren. Er is genoeg money in de gold supply chain to make these things happen. The issue is not is it possible, it's totally possible. The issue is, is there the political and the industry will to do it. The only way you're going to get that is if you actually insist on it as a consumer, as an investor. The whole fair trade export thing last year was 700,000 pounds. So that'll give you an idea of how small it is. But that was in the first year. That's 70,000 pounds of premium going back to the Satrami mine in Peru. Industrial mining, which represents 90% of the offer, it's the apps, uh, we've seen that this morning, it's not elastic. By the time you decide to mine, uh, and by the time you pour the first ingot, you can have 10 to 15 years. So now we are seeing the mines coming, which were explored in the early 2000s, which means when the price of gold was 300 or $400. So the elasticity of the industrial mining is almost zero. In front of that, what is elastic? It's the recycling. And today, this is uh, uh, the solution, which is now today to respond and satisfy the important market needs. And it is what we call the above the ground mine. The United States right now, uh, if you're a jeweler, you do not live from selling jewelry, you actually live from buying back jewelry and recycling it. The United States is, is now recovering more jewelry and, and scrapping more old jewelry than selling new jewelry. Just to give you an idea. Uh, that's of course totally different in emerging markets where the jewelry market is, is, is still uh, growing. But we should not forget, uh, mining is already a, uh, let's say, um, shrunk to 60% of uh, global supply. Since uh, 6, 5,000 years, we are mining gold and it doesn't consume, we accumulate it. And what do we see here is that there is 160,000 tons, which is equivalent to 60 years of mining. Okay, so we have 60 years of mining in stocks, and half of it is in jewelry form. There is 90,000 tons in jewelry, okay? Um, and the mine production today is, let's say, 2,500 tons. So you can live, let's say, 25, 30 years by recycling it. So you have enough gold in our hands to live without uh, importing any gold from mining. This is sufficient. The only driver there, once you have the near market jewelry, will be the price of gold. People will be interested to recycle their jewelry if they have a good price, if they can sell it for a higher price than they bought it. We estimate 23 grams per European, for example, which is plus or minus 15,000 tons in Europe. And out of that, every jewelry box of every European, we estimate 30 and 40 percent are jewels that are broken, out of fashion, without any sentimental value, that can be recycled easily. If this happens, then even over 10 years, means that we, have, we, we can be a net exporter of gold without having any mine. Electronic and other fabrication 
it's a market of around 400 tons, so 10% of demand. Uh, so it's a relatively smaller portion. That, of course, with modern technology, is 100% recyclable. Uh, and uh, people are actually uh, increasing the recovery rates. With the modern technologies, we would think that about 90% of that gold can be recovered. Gold is used to code switches or um, conduction um, circuits to prevent corrosion. So it's a very, very thin layer which is electroplated on top of copper. It's a very, very thin layer. And uh, an example of a mobile phone, so mo this is an average. Some indicate higher values, but this is what a mobile phone contains. So 24 milligrams of gold, silver. So electrical devices not only contain gold, they contain a variety of interesting elements. And this makes the whole recycling um, economic favorable. You, you directly get uh, several metals at once. The concentrations of gold, in the bijvoorbeeld electronic scrap, are ongeveer 10 keer hoger than die in ertsen. Dat betekent dat er toch een substantiële hoeveelheid kan gewonnen worden. Bijvoorbeeld uh, wat dat mobiele telefoon betreft, is er bijvoorbeeld de schatting dat er jaarlijks een 800 miljoen units kunnen worden gerecycleerd, wat ongeveer neerkomt op een tweetal ton goud die eruit zou kunnen geworden worden. Nu wat we wel zien is dat er effectief maar 3% van die mobiele telefoons tot bij de recyclagebedrijven geraakt. The recycling for us is a good solution because it's a virtuous mine. You extract the majority of the value of the extraction goes in the hand of the consumer. The government takes money because either you tax it, either you reinject this money in the economy. You create a full economy, like in Belgium you have one of the biggest recyclers in the electronic industry, so you create jobs, you create shops, you keep collecting things, and at the end you impact very bad, very less the, the, the environment. We have seen in the last five years uh, increasing demand for investment gold. You don't invest in gold. You buy gold when you don't trust the other assets. It's a protective asset. So with all the turmoils which are political, economical, then this is why investment gold has been in a rush 3.4 times since five years. The second reason is the diversification of the central bank's reserve. Money is changing. It's coming from the west, from the north, to Asia. And we see that central banks like the Chinese one, emerging countries, doesn't have a very low uh, part of gold in their reserves. For example, France, um, uh, central bank has more than 60% uh, reserves in gold. The US one has more than 80, and China uh, or India are uh, around two and nine, respectively. So those central banks are very, very uh, appetite in gold, and we, have, we haven't seen that since 20 years. Central banks are buying gold. What is important to know is when a central bank buys gold, you don't see it for 20 or 50 years or 100 years. It's, it's, it's like putting it back into a landfill, a landmine. We need to decommodify gold to fully understand it. Gold has a soul. It has an origin. It has a hand that it comes from. It has a location that it impacts. It has a community that is impacted, positively or negatively. We need to decommodify the system. I can run, sitting in London, a financial bot that basically tracks 24-7 all the gold transactions around the world. I can press the button on my screen, sit back, swig back my coffee, go to lunch, come back, and I can make millions and millions of pounds without moving my butt out of the square mile in London. Basically, digamos, debe manejarse el tema de metales preciosos, sobre todo, desde el punto de vista de, de no hacer especulación en las bolsas, porque en muchas economías y muchas empresas guardan, digamos, el oro como un respaldo para, sus, para su economía. Entonces, esto trae a la vez mayor precio en el mercado mundial del metal, 
y eso lógicamente impulsa a las transnacionales a ir a nuestros países donde los estándares ambientales son mínimos, donde eh, la tecnología puede hacer que extraigan oro eh, muy fácilmente a bajos costos. Because so many people buy gold as an investment option, and banks buy it, and governments buy it, and institutions buy it, and they short sell and make lots of money, and you know we we have to very we have to have more transparency on what is going on. I think the truth is, 99% of the world's population doesn't have a clue what goes on inside the financial institution, but those financial institutions are driving huge wealth around the globe 24 hours a day have very little accountability because they're transnational and cross-border and quite frankly there is no um, there is no authority there is no implication placed upon them to be socially environmentally responsible in their transactions they just buy and sell as though it's divorced from source we offer socially responsible investment products and we have mainstream uh, investment products which do not use this as a rice screening methodology. Uh, clients who said, this is important for me, I want this screening, they are served with this SRI methodology. Clients who, who says, for me it is indifferent, I don't take, it, it, it doesn't interest me, I want just to have an investment product they are served as well. It is completely comparable to, uh, to, to a shop where you can find uh, organic food next to non-organic food. It is just uh, responding to the client needs, client, client uh, demand. In each investment product we offer, we have a screening on companies who produ which produce controversial weapons. These are excluded from each investment uh, product. But the other screening criteria are only applied in the SRI uh, funds. 47 <coughs> mining companies are screened in our evaluation model, and we select eight on the, be on the best in class methodology, which are uh, best in class Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto Australia, Anglo American, uh, BHP Billiton, Lonmin, Strata, and Boliden. Newman mining is excluded, it happens to be best in class, but is excluded because it does not pass the UN Global Compact selection criteria. Esas empresas que certifican y que aparecieron hoy aquí, muchas son nada más que un sello y nada más que eso. Los pequeños productores del oro no son siempre reales. Las grandes empresas extraen oro y falsifican microemprendimientos por medio de los cuales sale el oro. No se investiga esa realidad falsificada. Los ejemplos más claros son los certificados ISO ambientales que tienen las multinacionales y que son falsos. Specific for our SRI clients, we made up a generic screening and evaluation instrument for these listed companies. But we know that this model is a model which can be improved and we are, we are very keen on, on receiving information, on receiving input, on how we can improve our concept. But nevertheless, the basic question I started with, with is it a contradiction to invest in the gold industry? From an SRI point of, point of view, for us it is uh, quite obvious that it is no contradiction in terms to invest in listed companies uh, from the uh, gold industry. If you are investing into a mining company, you are investing into environmental issues, for good or for bad. And in most cases, the mining companies get away with it because there's no transparency and there's no traceability and there's no accountability on what they do in the public arena. The Yanacocha mine is a filthy, dirty, stinking hole in the ground that should be filled over and gotten rid of ASAP. You will not change the, pro the, the practices of that company unless the consumer demands the change. No es posible que las empresas que vienen de Europa, o en este caso del norte del primer mundo, impunemente 
lleguen a nuestros países, a nuestros lugares, a nuestros Andes o a nuestra Amazonía, a causar grandes impactos y grandes daños, no solamente a la tierra, sino a la población. Esa responsabilidad ética y moral de los ciudadanos del norte, de los ciudadanos de Europa en este caso, apoyar a los pueblos del sur. Si you buy a piece of jewelry, think about what you're buying. You walk into the store, you look at it, the shop assistant might come up to you, help you make the purchase. There's nothing in that purchase which tells you the origin of what you're buying. Where does the gold come from? And the marketing of jewelry, the way we sell it, the way we convince you as the consumer to buy our emotional product, okay, is all about convincing you that what you're buying is separate from the mine that it's come from. You never see the mine. In our society, for many years, gold is seen as something pure. Uh, it's also when someone wins an award, it's often a golden globe or a golden medallion. So it has a very high value. If you look at the backside of the medallion, when you see that people are killed and so on, perhaps it's a strange connotation we make. <laughs> Y nuestras minas en el Perú son sinónimo de muerte, sinónimo de destrucción, sinónimo de persecución política. Nuestras minas en el Perú eh, son sinónimo de atentado contra el desarrollo sostenible y contra la cosmovisión de nuestros pueblos indígenas.